In this episode, we'll be talking about habitat use, or choosing where to live. One thing that we will have noted already is that certain kinds of animals tend to be associated with certain kinds of habitats. And this is true for just about every species. Like this least tern, a kind of maritime shorebird. You can tell that it's nesting on the sand. Whereas the least tern's nesting habitat is on the sandy beaches of the aquatic environment that they fly around in, there are many other species of terns that live elsewhere like the Forester's Tern, which nests in freshwater habitat shorelines. And then there's the Arctic Tern, which nests in marsh grasses. So these different but closely related species of birds seem to have sorted themselves out in such a way as to occupy different types of habitats. Presumably, this is a way of exploiting different ecological niches most effectively for themselves. So why do animals use habitats in different ways? We must suspect that habitat use is an adaptive trait, and that the different types of habitats can contribute either positively or negatively to the fitness of the animals that choose to live there. When habitats contribute positively to the fitness of the populations that are living in them, we call those source habitats, where the population will grow. Because this basically means that things are good for their survival and reproduction, such as plenty of places to stay and things to eat. However, there are other types of habitats where the same population of species would shrink in size, and we would call those sink habitats, where the populations dwindle, because the habitat is just not capable of supporting those numbers as effectively. So clearly, habitat has the potential to have great impacts on fitness by either supporting or not being able to support the animals that live there. We can observe this effect when habitats have varying levels or qualities of resources available to animals from one year to the next. For black-throated warblers, in years when resources are good and abundant, they can produce a higher number of offspring that survive to fledging the nest, whereas in years of poor resource availability and higher competition among the birds, they do not have as good a reproductive year because of the scarcity in their environment. Since the quality of the habitat can have such an impact on the fitness of the animals within it, when a high-quality habitat is discovered, it can lend itself to a behavior where animals will want to defend that habitat rather than lose the territory to other individuals who would like to come in and take it away from them. Territoriality is therefore an animal behavior of trying to keep a good habitat when one has it, hoping to benefit from its resources over time. However, the consequence of holding a good territory is that there will always be other individuals out there that would like to have it and take it away for themselves. We note that this territoriality defensiveness can manifest itself in a number of ways. There are some elegant displays of skill when male birds will dance and sing to ward off other males with one's impressive quality. But there can be more aggressive forms of territoriality as well, as we see in the male chimpanzees in Uganda who regularly patrol the boundaries of their territory. In many instances, these chimps cross into neighboring territories with acts of lethal aggression in which they engage with a male from a neighboring group and kill them. This in turn allows them to expand their own territory into larger ranges and presumably into other habitats that are of value to them. But these boundary disputes do not come for free and often lead to injury or death of the aggressors as well as the recipients of the marauding bands of murdering chimps. So territoriality and engaging in its associated aggressive, defensive, territorial behaviors can have some significant costs, as we've seen here with lethal results. But in other cases, the costs can be a little bit more subtle, such as due to a loss of energy or just wearing oneself out too quickly in life from engaging in risky and energetic activities. In many animal species, Males display territoriality through aggressive acts, which are under the influence of their testosterone levels within. However, 
Remember that testosterone also comes with negative impacts on health due to immunosuppression and general wear and tear on the body. In Arrow's spiny lizards, the males defend a rocky outcrop as their territory and keep all other males away by chasing them off the rock. As a benefit, those males that hold a rocky territory can get the attention of females for mating opportunities, if they're impressed by his ability to hold down a territory. Normally, most of the territoriality display is established in the mornings, and the males use the rest of the day to occupy their rocks and parade around for the females. However, when the lizards are experimentally implanted with high levels of testosterone, they continue their aggressive and energetic behaviors all day long. It was also found that those lizards that were jacked up on massive amounts of testosterone were less likely to survive to the following year. Presumably, they either made themselves too conspicuous to predators all the time, or they just wore themselves ragged physically and didn't have the stamina to survive to another year. Those tough guy lizards aren't so tough when they're dead, and it shows that territoriality can come with some extreme and important costs. You may have seen butterflies swirling around one another in bouts of territoriality for prime habitat which for them is a nice sunny spot in the forest. It may appear kind of dainty and innocent, in fact. It almost looks like it would be appropriate to have a Disney soundtrack playing over the scene, because it looks like they're dancing. But I assure you that they're fighting one another, and this is an aggressive act of territoriality, with the male resident butterfly trying to chase away an intruder who keeps coming back, trying to take hold of that sunny spot in the habitat which is very important for them to have so that they have a prime location to meet the female butterflies right where she wants to lay eggs on that vegetation. What we most often observe with these territoriality contests is that generally speaking, the original territory holders seem more often than not to be winning the bout whenever there's a challenge. As a result, they manage to defend and keep hold of their territory and the intruders need to move along. It appears the territory holders are the territory residents because they seem to have something that the territory intruders don't have. I mean, apart from the obvious territory itself. Meaning, the territoriality seems to be somewhat of an honest signal itself of the residents' ability to compete in general. So there may be something about having a resource holding power it's not that residents are just lucky, like they were the benefactors of a first-come, first-served scenario. But rather, it implies that they not only have the ability to locate and acquire a good territory, but also to be able to hold the residency because they will be continuously challenged by intruders. This honest reflection of the residence holder's status is a message that can be used by both males and females to assess whether or not they want to get involved with him. We can note the mechanisms by which the residency in a territory can reflect an honest signal of a male quality in looking at black-winged damselflies, whose males have territories of emergent vegetation near aquatic habitats, because the females lay their eggs in the water for the larva to be aquatic. The territoriality bouts involve extended chases on the wing, with dramatic and acrobatic entanglements until the intruders are successfully run off and the resident holder can return to his territory. When biologists looked at the differences in body size between the winners and losers of the aerial combat bouts, they found that the winners consistently had a higher fat content than the losers, which gave them the energetic endurance advantage that they needed to outfly their competitors. In this case, as in most others, the territory holders do in fact have something that the intruders do not have and are indeed higher quality individuals, which is the endurance potential to outlast their competitors in this case. So therefore, when female damselflies are selecting mates based on this territoriality, not only do they get access to the aquatic habitat that they need to lay their eggs, but it's also an adaptive strategy allowing them to select mates from the highest quality males in the population. 
And so, by evaluating individuals who are territory holders, it seems to be an effective way of evaluating the general status and quality of those individuals overall. When we talk about habitat choice, we must also discuss why and when animals don't stay in their territories, and many will disperse away from their natal habitat. We must presume that dispersals are adaptive if we see them having evolved time and again among many different animal groups. In the Belding's ground squirrel, there are many closely and distantly related families that nest colonially in chambers and tunnels that they excavate underground. In this species, many individuals from a colony will disperse away from their natal burrows in hopes of joining another group somewhere else and finding new mating opportunities. It turns out that these individuals are almost always the males. The dispersal of mating males away from the colony makes sense on a couple of levels. Firstly, given that the colonies are made up of several families that may be related to each other in one way or another, by mating outside of the colony, these individuals have a greater chance of avoiding inbreeding depression and benefiting from increased genetic diversity for their offspring. Secondly, the reason that it is the males that disperse away and not the females has to do with the cooperative breeding strategies in this species, in which the young are mutually cared for by many female adult members of their extended family throughout the burrow. In this particular ecological context of colonial breeding in large underground burrows, it makes sense for the males to disperse and the females to stay put, because the costs and benefits to each sex are not the same in both situations. Males benefit more by leaving, and the females benefit more by staying. Generally speaking, dispersal is a way of moving around to find new opportunities. On a larger scale, there are some animals that travel around on a planetary level, such as the intercontinental migrations that occur on an annual basis. Here in the northern temperate areas, we find many species of birds, mammals, and insects that actively migrate down towards Central and South America for the winter. And then, they come all the way back up for their breeding season the following year. There must be great benefits to this migratory behavior because it can come with a huge expense in terms of energy and time, not to mention the risk associated with flying over uncertain or hostile territory. The exemplar of this plight is the Arctic Tern, who flies the equivalent of a 30,000 km round trip when they leave the Arctic Ocean of Canada in the fall for their overwintering grounds on the other side of the planet, in the Antarctic Ocean. This massive journey is justified by the benefits of escaping an environment that is rapidly degrading and becoming less and less hospitable for animals in terms of having food, appropriate temperature, and shelter, for example. So they get away because, well, the winters here are just so harsh. I think many of us would like to be able to do that as well. In the following spring, they do the opposite and head back north as the southern hemisphere begins to enter its winter seasons and the habitat down there begins to degrade in hospitality just as predictably. However, we know that many, if not most, migratory birds will fly to their overwintering grounds in the tropics, which do not undergo such dramatic seasonal shifts as are seen in the northern or southern temperate zones. One could ask why those species would return back to Canada in the spring for breeding instead of staying there, where biodiversity levels are among the highest in the world and resources are abundant. I know I ask myself that very same question when it's time for me to come home from a trip to Central America. For these species that do return to the northern Canadian breeding grounds, the main benefit is that of the huge expanse of habitat to choose from, as well as the relative poverty of predators compared to the tropics. So we see that as the seasonality of the different habitats shift, there are benefits to leaving for new pastures and costs to staying in the harsh or overcrowded ones. 
Despite the benefits to migratory animals as they move around the planet in search for the right place to be at the right time of year, we can't deny that the behavior comes with a number of important costs, including direct costs on energy consumption and physiological endurance, as well as potential costs of injury or death as they wander over unknown, dangerous, and hostile territories. Because migrations can be extremely costly behaviors, we would expect evolution to favor selection that can reduce the costs of migration. One of the ways that flying animals can reduce the cost is by engaging in formation flying, as opposed to flying alone because it can have energetic savings due to a reduction in the amount of drag from the wind. This is what we often observe if we look up in the sky and watch our Canada geese migrating down south in the fall in a flying V formation. It is usually the strong adults out front and the younger, weaker birds in the back honking away, honk, 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 the whole way there. They're probably saying, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Or I need to pee to their exasperated parents driving up front. For the geese flying in the formations, with one individual diagonally behind the one in front, it reduces the drag from the wind by promoting more laminar airflow and decreasing turbulence. As such, the younger birds can glide along behind the adults with less of a requirement for energetic output in these weaker, novice migrators. These migratory behaviors are adaptive and help to reduce the cost-benefit ratio of migration and favor it to happen in species that fly over great distances. Other birds that leave the Ottawa area in the fall for their southern migration do so alone and can't benefit from the efficiencies allowed by formation flying. However, as we see here in our familiar red-eyed vireo, you know, the ones that are singing, Here I am, where are you? In the Gatineau Park in the springtime? Well, they'll be flying down to Central America alone for the winter. These little songbirds will face a lot of challenges along the way, including having to sleep in unfamiliar trees, but most substantially, they will find themselves faced with the daunting open body of water that is the Gulf of Mexico once they've reached the southern coast of eastern USA. Once at the Gulf Coast, they will be faced with a personal decision to fly over the Gulf, which is the quickest but most dangerous route, because if the Vireo gets tired, they can't land or else they'll drown. Or to take the safe route along the eastern coast of Mexico which is much longer and has its own share of danger from predators and unfamiliar terrain. But the key is that you can rest if you get tired. Research has shown that vireos that are experimentally weakened by being fed food with a lower nutritional quality would be more likely to choose the land route compared to flying over the gulf, whereas healthy and strong vireos generally choose the waterway. This is because many animals are capable of assessing their own physical status and to make decisions based on their chances of overcoming significant costs. For a strong bird who can make the continued flight, it makes sense to fly over the gulf, but not for a bird that's feeling a little bit tired. In this case, they may opt for the lesser of two evils despite it being a less than ideal alternative, but it's better than being dead. In the dynamic and shifting scenarios that are found along these long migratory routes, we find that evolution has often favored abilities in animals to choose the optimal behaviors to employ on a decision-by-decision -decision basis. One of the most iconic annual migrations is the one taken across North America by this colorful insect, the monarch butterfly, whose adults leave southern Canada in the fall to travel across the USA to their overwintering grounds in central Mexico. The following spring, they will return, stopping in American milkweed stands along the way to feed and reproduce, allowing new individuals to return to Canada the following year to complete the summer breeding cycle. Given what we already know about Canadian winters, it should come as no surprise as to why these insects leave in the fall. 
But what is more intriguing is that they all go to the same forest in the mountains of central Mexico and nowhere else. What is it about these forests that are so crucial that billions of individual monarchs will migrate to there alone? Despite coming from different locations from coast to coast in Canada and northern USA, all monarchs in North America go to that same forest in Mexico. That must be a pretty special place to have evolved as the only winter habitat that is suitable for the whole continent's population of butterflies. It turns out that the forest cover in these particular mountains of Mexico provide the ideal microclimate for the overwintering monarchs allowing them to quietly rest over the winter months without risk of frost. Unfortunately, these forests are being reduced by local farmers who are looking to convert the land into pasture for livestock or fields for agriculture. It is certainly understandable that the Mexican farmers need to earn a living and feed their families, but it is putting increasing stress on the resilience of a forest that is crucial to the survival of the entire continent's population of monarch butterflies. As the forest dwindles in size or canopy cover, it is less effective at buffering against drops in temperatures or increased humidity, both of which can lead to freezing in the sensitive monarchs. This is especially true when both threats occur together and humid butterflies under a cool open sky can find themselves in lethal danger within minutes the monarchs had evolved to need the habitat protection provided by the intact forests in Mexico, not reduced or patchy versions of them. Here we see that human encroachments on nature may have dramatic species conservation implications because of the effects on a distinct behavior that has served those animals for millennia, only to have their environment changed on them more rapidly than they can adjust to it. If we can't find ways to allow the citizens of central Mexico to live sustainably and prosperously in their own regions, we see that it can have implications on biodiversity that are felt across the entire continent. Such is the link that often lies between human activities and environmental or ecological well-being. As usual, behaviors are only adaptive in certain specific contexts. We continue to see our destructive human activities changing the environmental and ecological context for our neighboring animals, and we're saddened but unsurprised to find that these changes often lead to the animal behaviors becoming less effective or even maladaptive. In conclusion, we see that animals use habitat adaptively, and that there are behaviors involved in the selection of the habitat as well as the interaction with the habitat once they get there. A good quality habitat will positively influence the fitness of animals that live in it. And conversely, a poor quality habitat will detract from their fitness. Because there are some habitats that are beneficial to occupy and to use, animals have an interest in maintaining a hold on their habitats through territoriality, or else to pick up and try their luck somewhere else.